I'm Rachel. Uh, very happy to be part of the Big Tent in action. Though that sort of sounds like the type of movie they might be actually making next door. <laughs> so we're not being filmed here for that, at least. Um, so m much of what uh, Hugh said really obviously resonates with me. I began Change the Ratio because across of all the endeavors that I was doing, first I was a lawyer, then I was in the world of comedy, and then I sort of settled into the world of media where I ended up covering politics and you know, and basically anything that had to do with media, so film. And so I watched, you know, Katie Couric ascend to, as the first female anchor in 2006, and I watched Hillary Clinton run for president to potentially be the first female president in 2008. Still have some PTSD left from that. Uh, and I, you know, watched Catherine Bigelow accept the Academy Award for Best Director for the first time in 2010. And there's just a lot of firsts, and, and every time that happens, you wonder, my God, how is it possible that we're well into this century and still having all of these firsts? And it's still such a big deal. And then we have Marissa Mayer, who's the first CEO to be pregnant, and Sheryl Sandberg, who is certainly not the first woman to achieve success and then <laughs> be the subject of a torrential backlash <laughs> as a result. So it's always high time for these conversations, and it's always high time to have them here at South by Southwest where, as Hugh points out, we really do get sort of a, a wild cornucopia of people to have these discussions. I actually wanted to frame our beginning here with a panel that's, all, that's going on right now that you're all not at. Uh, I tweeted earlier that I was sort of missing it. It was one of the comedy panels. It's, uh, it's called something like, something like, you know, from podcast to TV, and it's got uh, Scott Ackerman from IFC and Fred Armisen from Portlandia, um, I believe Mark Moran, and one other dude. And it's panel dudes, as comedy panels often are. And it really says something because these, this is a panel where people, excited hopefuls will go to find out how to take their podcast to TV. And the people who are saying how to do that are all dudes, which suggests that it's a lot easier for dudes to take their podcast to TV. And We'll just start from that default, that we can, we'll just all agree it's a generalization, but the default is it's easier for dudes to get ahead faster, further, with less, what my mom likes to call koich, from her Yiddish background, but koich is just like stress, aggravation, and just stuff in your way that's a pain in the butt. And I know that I have a lot of koich in my life, <laughs> and I'm sure all these women have a lot of koich in their life. So, I don't even know how to spell that, don't even bother trying to tweet that, but um, you can just call it aggravation and that thing that goes so often unnamed where people just assume that the reason that five white dudes are on a stage is because of meritocracy. So that is our lead in. We're going to talk about that today and uh, I'm going to start with our very meritocratic panel. Uh, first with Christina Wallace, who is the, the newly anointed director of Startup School, now renamed the Startup Institute, right? <laughs> Just checking. Formerly the founder of Quincy Apparel, uh, a, a graduate of Harvard Business School, uh, all around kicker of butt, <laughs> and uh, certainly has had her, her experiences in, term, in being in many rooms and being the only woman. Mm -hmm. uh, next is Kathleen Warner, former lawyer, but like me, but we've put it all behind us and the stress there and all that quick. Uh, she is the uh, Chief Operating Officer at Startup America and in charge of their initiatives regarding women in startups as well. Now we've got Kristen Jones, uh, who is from Vugaroo. Nice. I know, this, this, it's just Vugaroo, like the electric Vugaloo, like the electric Vugaroo. Uh, the digital studio uh, started by Michael Eisner, and which has been doing some amazing stuff. Uh, if you have not seen, is it called The Booth in the Corner? Yeah, the Booth at the End. The Booth at the End, truly chilling, if you like being freaked out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Kristen is the Chief Creative Officer. And finally, Marisi Vinton, who comes to us from the tech side of things, having uh, captained the tech infrastructure at the CFPB, and, uh, and is formerly a, a veteran of Obama for America, back when it really was changing the game. I mean, we, can't, we can all argue that it would change the game this year, but we all knew how to tweet and stuff in 2012. In 2008, OFA truly was a game changer, and it really did re rely on the ingenuity of 
uh, people like Mauricio to make that happen. So I guess we, <coughs> we, this was originally configured to be a series of conversations, but we realized that, we realized in the green room, aka the ladies' bathroom, that uh, these are conversations best had in open forum with people talking to each other uh, as, in, as opposed to just like me putting questions at you. So this is gonna be sort of chill. We're gonna talk about stuff. And I guess I wanna jump right into it and say to all of you as well, how many times, and men, this isn't for you, sorry. How many times have you been the only woman in a room that you're in for a professional reason? All right, I'm gonna throw this out to the men now. How many times have you been the only man in a room that you're in for a professional reason? I, or how often? Often, often, all right, hi. Thank you. All right, yes, hooray. Point being, there, the issue of being the only woman in the room is, a, or the only one of a type in a, the room is a pretty classic other experience. And that's what we're talking about today. So uh, I want to start first with Christina. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to hear about your most striking experience where you, was, where you were like, oh my god, I'm the only woman in the room. And tell me about that. Sure. I mean, so uh, Quincy Apparel, my former startup, was a brand created to rethink how women's clothes were made. Um, we were really frustrated with the fact that the assumptions underlying uh, pattern making, even in 2012 at the time, um, you know, assumed a B-cup bra size, assumed an hourglass shape, and if you don't have that shape, good luck buying clothes off the rack. And you know, I went out to raise money. Uh, for this startup. Uh, it has a, a predecessor in a number of other startups like Bonobos and Warby Parker, vertically integrated e-commerce. It's not a new business model. And uh, most of the people that I was pitching were men. Uh, and that's fine. I get that most uh, investors are men, and so that didn't really throw me. I, I was prepared for that until I realized that um, halfway through some of these conversations, they had no idea why this was a problem that our clothes didn't fit us. Um, or, or how much our clothes didn't fit us. And it took three months of attempting to fundraise, unsuccessfully, by the way, which is a problem when you're fundraising because you start getting this perception of she hasn't been able to raise money yet, what's wrong with her or what's wrong with the company. Um, it, it took about three months of this conversation to realize that I had to go back to the beginning and explain to them, okay, when you buy jackets, you have uh, 40 long or a 44 regular, and what do those numbers correspond to? They correspond to your body measurements, okay? So when I go to buy clothes, I walk into a store and say, I'd like an eight. Except I'm six feet tall. Do you think that eight's actually gonna fit? No, like my boobs are two inches lower than a girl who's like of normal size and a size eight. So these clothes are not gonna fit me, and this is a problem because I am a professional woman existing in this professional world, and I have to go into a boardroom or be among partners and, and feel confident in my clothes. I was trained as an actress originally, and so much of how you feel about yourself comes from how you feel in your clothes. Your costume is 50% of your character, which is one thing we talked about a lot in school. And having to explain to men what it feels like to not feel like you fit your clothes, and how much that changes how you present yourself, and what that means for <laughs> rock star girls coming out of undergrad, getting these competitive jobs at banks and consulting firms and law firms, and then showing up and spending the whole first day like fiddling with their shirt, or like wearing things that make them look ridiculous, and, and it's the best they can do. And so that was the big frustration for me when we finally got this realization of like, they don't even get that this is a problem. So we, we changed how we presented it to them, and then <laughs> their next questions were always like, well, how big is this market? Right? I mean, we're only half the population. Not that big. Um, so this was my big frustration coming in in what I thought was an established industry vertical. There were successful business models coming out of this already going after glasses and men's clothes. Um, and you know, I'm a Harvard MBA, like many other recent successful tech entrepreneurs, uh, with a rock star team, and going in and not being taken as seriously for my product and for my team and for my, my business as my male counterparts. Yeah, you had me at boobs, by the way. <laughs> um, Kathleen, uh, on the, in, in DC, you're, uh, where Startup America is headquartered, and in the world of tech. So how have you seen this, this issue manifested? You know, it, 
what Startup America is really focused on connecting up with uh, high growth entrepreneurs wherever they live, whatever they look like. Part of our whole mission is to really celebrate the entrepreneur, you know, whether they're in Nebraska or a woman or a turn up or you know whatever it is. And it, it's um, you know uh, to your point earlier, Rachel, about uh, seeing mo you know models of behavior that one can. Um, you know, aspire to is really, really key. And you know, so we have this sort of a women's initiative, but it's not like we're doing anything particularly special. It's just trying to be sensitive to where there are places that, you know, women should be showing up. Because community, community is made up of lots of different people coming from lots of different places, you know, old white ladies like me and, every, you know, and everything else. Um, I think what most struck me is, you know, th there's this notion, I think it's changing, which I'm hopeful about, um, you know, it, 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 I, I hear time and again, we totally want to fund a woman, to your point, or we totally welcome women into our accelerator co-working space, awesome beer pong drinking, <laughs> you know, shot drinking event, totally into that, doing that the other night, actually. You know, it's awesome. Um, but again, if, it, you know, it, it's one thing to, you know, to sort of sit back, it's like with a company, right? You, you build a company, you can't just sit back and like, I built this awesome thing, they're all gonna come to me, right? Mm -hmm. You go and you build and you figure out who your customers are, how to connect, how to get out there. Well, guess what? It's the same thing if you're saying, I'm trying to attract more, you know, more people, more vibrancy, more diversity. It's about figuring out how to make whatever that, that thing is, whether it's a VC firm or an accelerator or an awesome event, how do I make this feel really awesome and welcoming to lots of different people that don't necessarily look or seem like me? Um, and, and that's been, you know, that, uh, that awareness, I feel, has grown over the last year, but I think there's still work to do, frankly. Do you, uh, is, is there a specific blind spot? Is there like a moment where you're like, wow, I totally didn't even think of seeing that? I, 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 I mean, say it again. Like the, just like a blind spot where you came up against something. Yeah. And like, for example, yeah. in, uh, when I was at Mediaite, yeah. uh, which Hugh mentioned the thing that I did with Dan Abrams, which I'm not doing anymore, but when we were at Mediaite, uh, one of our writers, did a retrospective at the, at, at the end of, I guess, 2009, entering 2010, about the people we lost, all the media figures we lost right. this decade. And there were men, there were women, there were just no people of color. And yep. I had yep. green, I'd like gone through and like, check, check, great, go publish, and hadn't noticed. And then it mm -hmm. sort of, it, it flared up as it should have in the yep. black community, and we yep. issued an apology, and I've never made that mistake again. Like, is that a... Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a great point. And look, I fall into, I, I law, investment banking, you know, government stuff. So I've also been in very traditional, traditionally male types of industry. Somebody said to me the other day, I don't even think of you as a woman. You're just like you, you know? So I just, I've always operated in a place. And I remember we did the very first Startup America, um, our first year celebration, we're two years old. And I was so excited. We got these awesome, iconic people. We had this all entrepreneur board, which is actually fairly diverse, but we did a big event in Chicago, which was our very first region that launched. So I'm totally psyched to get up there, and someone like taps me on the shoulder and he's like, what's with all the, the middle-aged white dudes? I was like, oh my god. I, you know, I just, it was a panel kind of thing, and it was sort of the light bulb for me. I've always, you know, in the years that I've been in various professions, I've always been sitting at the table, where are the women in the room, where are the women lawyers, where are the women investment bankers, where, you know, where are the women? But for some reason, I, it just didn't click. I was like, oh yeah, you know, it's J.B. Pritzker. It's this, you know, lots of awesome, awesome entrepreneurs, but I just, I hadn't thought about it. And ever since, my team just loves me because I'm always like, that's great. We, we go for 50%. We're like, let's, we don't always do it, but we're, we're very, very mindful of working our network of networks. So I mean, so the list has been great for me to just be like, okay, you know, I don't know people out there, you know, who you got? So that was a, that was a really kind of defining moment of my own blind spot, blind, you know, uh, bias, if you will. And I mean, it's it's often indicated by something as simple as here are T-shirts. We have them in boy sizes, size large, extra mm -hmm. large, and extra extra large. Um, although we had a lot of people of men requesting small change ratio T-shirts <laughs> yeah. at, at our events. But even the, even as much as um, you know heels. Like mm. events that don't consider that half the attendees will be wearing heels. Like the, these are these are things that if you are a person who often wears heels, you will think of. If you are a person who defaults to sneakers, as I have been lucky to do since my injury, uh, it uh, it definitely changes. So, all right, I wanna I wanna focus in on on power and what power looks like because you're in Hollywood, and that's where you know notoriously. 
because we've actually seen it dramatized so much mm. more than in these other areas, we've seen the dramatization of the, you know, the Hollywood industry uh, as being dominated by these you know, male gatekeepers and male power players. So what, how have you experienced sort of the changing way power looks like in Hollywood and being part of that change because uh, as a powerful Hollywood woman? Um, it's definitely, uh, I think, has gotten better in certain regards, but uh, I'll never forget about 12 or 13 years ago when I was at Disney in London and I was meeting with, um, the he I was back, I was living in London, but back in Burbank where the studio is headquartered to meet about some of the initiatives I was working on and I was meeting with the chairman of the actual studio, not the chairman of the company, but, and his whole team. And I remember sitting there thinking at one point while I was talking to them all, I'm the only woman and I'm a good 10 years younger than any of these men in this room. Um, and it was kind of a bizarre kind of moment in my life where I thought this is utterly bizarre. Um, and I'm happy to report that I think things, certainly in the studio side and the network side of Hollywood, I think in terms of decision making have changed right now, all three divisions of Fox Creative on the studio on the motion picture side are run by women. Those three divisions, um, their TV studio 20th Television is run co-run by a woman. Um, the chairman, of one of their, the, the co-chair of Sony is a woman. The co-chair of Universal is a woman. Um, you know, various networks have various um, creative decision makers that are women. So I think that ratio has definitely gotten better. That said, you know, I'm now three years into this world, this kind of, you know, nexus between tech and still on the creative side because obviously our, our distribution platforms are now places like the Netflixes and Hulus and places like that. Those places are still, because they come from tech, predominantly male, and I will say, while there are lots of writers, or I, I've definitely been working with some female writers, we're starting a show in two weeks that's written by two women, the, direct, the, women, the female directors, as evidenced by Catherine Bigelow, and, and you know, this year at Sundance, it was a huge deal and a huge milestone that they had literally 50% male and 50% female filmmakers. That's the first time in 20 odd years that the, you know, that the, um, festivals existed where that's ever happened. So I do think those numbers are changing. Um, what's gonna be interesting as technology becomes more relevant in Hollywood in terms of you know, the collapsing of windows and Hollywood's going through a real revolution the way that the movie, or sorry, that the music business did, hopefully women will be able to retain a foothold in that because obviously as evidenced by some of these stories, tech is you know, a very male heavy uh, world or corporate world. Uh, just to to your point about Sundance, when, when more women are, are in contention, more women win the big awards. Yeah. And so we saw you know, Jill Soloway mm -hmm. won the directing award at Sundance, and yeah. Lake Bell won the screenplay award, two really big awards. And like, that makes a really big deal for if your movie will get bought. Mm -hmm. Because this also comes down to money. And we'll, we'll be talking about money a little bit later. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to go to Marisi and, and talk a little bit. We talked about being in the room with, with old white men. Uh, but what about the, in, in the tech world, it really seems that the, the, the paradigm for the successful techie is a young male, usually a dropout of an Ivy League university, um, <laughs> if we're talking about privilege. Uh, and and, and what, what we saw after, particularly after the, the 2012 election, was the real lionization of the, the men of, of Obama for America. There was like, you know, the Atlantic did something on like oh, the yeah. beards for Obama and talked about all the bearded dudes on the campaign and Mother Jones did something called Men Who Stare at Votes, all about the team. And, and so like the woman on team Obama were like looking at this stuff and saying like, these guys work for me, what is going on here? Yeah. Mm. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about um, that side of things from the tech side. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the Obama campaign because it's like exactly to your point, so many of the people that were being, you know, were being profiled in the newspaper all worked for women. So the head of data analytics and email analytics, women. Uh, the uh, so she did digital projects, but Amelia Showalter and another woman that did data, I forget. Um, but yeah, it's really fascinating that, and f it's, it was actually a little bit easier in 2012, because like Laura Olin, so f women are, are t being talked, but it still is really interesting that, the, I think it's maybe, this is off topic a little bit, but I think it's because a lot of people from Blue State Digital, which is all mm. men. Um, so that's kind of the culture and how, how it all plays out in, day to day. You know, it's, it's interesting, working in DC, it wasn't much different. 
in government, and then that's probably not a surprise, but I started a technology team in government, and it was really difficult to find women or people of color that wanted to work on our team. Hey, but also DC, right? DC is a kind of a, a small place that's not really known for its tech hotness, and I can't believe I just said hotness. It's tech anything, right? There's about five developers. Everybody tweet that she just said hotness. Please don't. <laughs> There's about five developers, and they're probably cold fusion. Um, and so it was really, it's, it's, it's also kind of a, a hard place to find talent, but I, I'm so certain that having more diverse teams, both in gender and um, backgrounds, leads to better products, because I've seen it happen. Better ideas, better products, mm -hmm. not because, just because nobody has a monopoly on the ideas. And the more voices that you have in the room that aren't your own and aren't exactly like yours and maybe have different backgrounds are only going to lead to a better <laughs> outcome. And that's, and that's how I kind of met up with Rachel is because I'm so passionate about helping kind of, I mean, when you're working in government, it's about making better products for real people. And real people are all across the country and they're different genders and they're different backgrounds and they live in the middle of nowhere. So, so that's, that's why I'm here today. So, okay, so we've named the problem the, <laughs> in varying degrees. It's the problem of, you know, relative invisibility, the problem of, you know, like a, a default assumption of what power, success, and leadership looks like. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not only something that we can blame on the rest of the world, you know, as uh, Kathleen and I both recounted from our own experience, like, we do it too. Mm -hmm. You know, like, having to, you know, the, the problem of having to first get to the point where you are aware of your privilege mm -hmm. and then you can see beyond it. And we haven't, I mean, we haven't even talked about all of the other groups. You know, like there's, there, mm -hmm. there are class issues, there are age issues, there are, uh, there's obviously like sexual orientation as a major issue. Like we, basically when you like slice and dice the population, you really do get to a, the place where like you can really argue that like the only group that really hasn't made are the white, straight, upper class men. But then, of course, when you break it down to individuals, that doesn't mean that every single you know, man of that description is going to automatically rocket and easily to the top. All it means is, as John Scalzi said, is that in the video game of life, that's the easiest difficulty setting. And then as you progress on, the difficulty setting gets a little bit higher, a little bit higher. So mm -hmm. what now can we do? Because we're all action-oriented and solution-oriented. So I want to now go through and ask you one thing you did to fix the problem really fast? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think one thing that's always played into my favor is my size, right? Like, I can look almost any dude either in the eyes or, as we talked about earlier, I can look down on them and see how their hair is thinning. So, um, <laughs> so in terms of, you know, I, I didn't have the card stack in my favor and that I'm not a dude and that I don't come from privilege um, and, and I don't have sort of inherent power that way, but I can fabricate power and influence in other ways. So I learned to be a really great storyteller. I learned that I can influence people by convincing them of you know, the value of what it is I care about and getting them to care about it too. Um, I learned that I can walk into a room as a six foot tall woman who wears heels most of the time and have uh, you know, a presence. I can take up space. I can get people to pay attention to me um, and not but because I'm pretty or I'm wearing a low cut shirt or a short skirt. I can do it because I speak up and I, I insist that I have a presence and that they should pay attention. So, you know, it's not for everyone. My roommate is four foot eight. This is not a technique that might work for her. Um, but for, you know, someone who says, you know, I have some natural things that, that can give me power, that can give me um, that feeling of like, I do belong here, listen up. Um, you know, use what you've got. So, you know, with Startup America, we, we, we've reached out and in part, because we talk a lot about reaching companies, and so we were really uber-focused on connecting up. And so 42% of the 13,000 startups in the Startup America network are women-led, or, or partial women-led. 42%? Um, yeah, something like that. That's Maybe 40. Um, that's, that's pretty great. awesome. That's great, though. It's yeah, than the that's, 35% of yeah. the only at South by, it's so. Full yeah. or partial. So it's, you know, it, yeah. it, we don't, you know, so we, I think that's pretty damn good. And, but to your point mm. too, I, you know, I get out there a lot. Um, I, you know, I, I always count, to, I have kind of a bizarre, I don't have a linear career. Mm. It hasn't been easy. I have a family. I live in Connecticut. I work in DC. I travel all the time. 
Um, but I, I, uh, for me, it's incumbent about, you know, in some sense, as you said, creating some space, talking about my story, talking about my struggles, what worked, what hasn't, where I totally screwed up things, dusted myself off and got back up again, because I really, really believe that it's important for me to kind of be out there and to kind of own that I can be inspirational to other people, mm. whatever their journey is. And so that's something that I've just really made a real commitment to over the last two years. Mm. So. so my tip is I send very, very long emails to people she relentlessly. Does. <laughs> For me, I think it was you know, about doing the work. I think you know, one can't assume that there are, I mean, yes, luck, timing have a lot to do with things in life. And I do believe the harder you work, the, better, the more you earn your luck. Uh, to a degree, but I think for me it was always just being on the ball, doing a good job, and showing people that I was capable of having the responsibility and, and that I could be in those rooms with all those guys and do just as good, if not better, of a job as they did. And um, I think, you know, that that's always kind of how I wanted to make myself known was just by doing the work and being respected. Did you ever, ever, ever have to point out that you were doing the work? I mean, you often hear as women, like you can't just be heads down yeah. and do good work and hope people notice. You actually have to also market the fact that yeah, you're doing that Yeah, and I mean, work. you know, I, I definitely, look, I'm in a very social business. You know, when I was at Disney and at Miramax, I spent three, year, three months a year on the road going to various film festivals and, you know, as one of the people who would be convincing filmmakers to entrust us with their films or their finished, you know. So obviously there is a definite social component to that as well. Um, and, and charm and personality and things definitely are a part of that. But at the end of the day, I mean, let's face it, I'm in a business where that kind of schmoozing, some, many would argue, some people have gotten ahead that didn't have the skills. I do believe at the end of the day, you know, if you don't do the work, it will catch up with you at some point. So, so I would say two things that kind of I, I work towards. One is the first one that's been really important for me over the last two to three years is educating myself and then taking those lessons and, and trying to talk to other women and other people around them and helping educate them. And so great examples of it are I, a few years ago, I thought it was okay when I would say things like, oh, you're just a crazy girl or um, you're sensitive or oh, you're being dramatic. And mm -hmm. it wasn't until I had a boss who would say these things to me. And after many months of it, I realized the impact it had on my life. That I'm now, and now I tell, I'm very open about the fact that actually those aren't things that you say to people. Mm. And just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I'm sensitive. Uh, I think that is not a gender specific thing. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to, to talk about that in my work. Right now I'm working in consulting and if I see things happen, like that when we're working with companies or coaching managers, um, but also just with other women, A, stop apologizing, which I do all the time. And the other way, um, so at the, in Rachel and I, we've talked about this a little bit. I, so I'm also, like I mentioned earlier, really into getting more women and people of color into technology in government, because uh, it's just, it's, it's tr tragic. And um, so at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we had a fellowship program and I, it was my kind of job to help really figure out a plan and how do we make a diverse team. Because like I said, I'm so committed to, I believe it'll make a better product. And so, uh, so we had metrics around it and we tried to, around our recruitment approach. And basic metrics, not rocket science, like have a viable female candidate for every position, you know, interview, like interview a viable woman. Um, have, go to, reach out to, Google groups where there are women tech leaders, and and that's this kind is of an innovation, by the way, that the White House has has done in the past six months. Mm. But they did it at, only after they sent out a call for the White House presidential fellows, their innovation fellows, and they had yeah. two out of eighteen. And then so when they two got some 18. blowback, and so mm. now they've been, you know, the four women's listservs that I'm on are constantly <laughs> like flooded with calls for mm. people to submit. That didn't happen before. You have to go where people are. Mm. Exactly. And that's, and that they've, they've really done, the White House has really done a better job of that. Mm. And I left CFPB before, um, before we hired people, but I've heard we have a really diverse thing, so it actually works, and that's mm. exciting. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the two things I've had. But I think you, you've really hit on the fact that, um, you know, you, you have to be, it's, I often, 
I invoke Yoda, as one does, useful in the tech world, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, is like, do or do not, there is, there is no try, no try. Mm. right? So all the people are like, we really, really tried, we really, really tried, we couldn't find someone, we had someone and then they left, and whatever, all of those like, are completely legit because you really did try and you really did have the best intentions and actually I can say the same thing about this panel because we're all white and mm -hmm. you know, the, we came together a little bit at the last minute and it's at the very end of the day at Interactive, so people of color I reached out to were all gone or they were like, sorry, we had to leave early. I mean, so do or do not, there is no try. And I think that when you, when you look at it that way, it's like, okay, is it about results? Would you ever say, sorry, 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 I really tried to your boss after you were supposed to deliver like X amount of results to, you know, for whatever it is you were supposed to do. Yeah. So when, if it was part, it was, if it was as important enough as sort of getting all the sponsors as it was for, for conferences to get, to make sure they had an appropriate amount of diverse contenders on panels, mm -hmm. then it would happen. Because mm -hmm. people wouldn't just say that they, you know, they tried, oh, and mm -hmm. it didn't it's happen. Metrics. You know, I, I also want to say though, you know, and, and I think it's important for the institutions, for men, to, that the awareness piece is really, really key for other women to be. But I also think it's really key for women to step up. I mean, one of the biggest, mm. fr most frustrating things I experience is we'll have some contests. It's like, go to demo or we'll play your way to South by. And I'll get, you know, just one minute pitch. No, you know, and so I'll get like a hundred from guys that are like, yeah, I got this awesome new social media thing where you connect with your friends in conference rooms, whatever. And the women are like, well, it's not quite perfect. And I'm really working on it. And we're, we're literally calling up the women to do this. And sometimes, that, and I see this with pitch sessions, mm -hmm. it's like defer, deferral to the co-founder. And look, it's like, it's a, it's a Startup America panel. You get like, you know, a C blank book. It's not like you're, you know, it's like not gonna make or break you, but women do have to put themselves out there. It's really hard, hard, hard work to build companies. It's hard to get out there. You're probably gonna fail more than you're gonna succeed. But you, you know, I understand the challenges around it. And I understand there's institutional challenges, and we all got to do this together. But women, you know, I, that's what I extort women to do, which is why I tell my story about falling on my face all the time. But women got to do it because I, I don't want anybody to think in the room that this is like, oh, it's all about the dudes in the institutions. Mm -hmm. no, it's it, also about it us. But it's, it it's is. About it's true. How you know, we all get un we get messages subtle totally. throughout our lives, and this is why when I, you know, inevitably when I'm looking at an audience and I ask people if there are questions, I see women do this. Mm -hmm. And men are just like this, or yelling. Or if it, I've, I've actually I experienced this at TechCrunch Disrupt where where Michael Arrington was like, we're going to take ten questions, you know, and then like one, two, three, four. All right, that's fine. Everybody else sit down. And so I went and sat down, and dudes Don't stayed sit down. and stayed still when I got. And he took more questions. And Cheryl Sandberg uses this this example mm -hmm. too. And I think so. Like there is this this element of obeying instructions, mm -hmm. behaving versus breaking the rules and saying that you don't they don't apply to you. Obviously mm. we're not saying, you know, security's fraud. But no, but I it, think there's there's something about like a ballsiness yeah. to it for lack of, of a word that can be applied to everyone. <laughs> well and also just taking yeah. risks. I mean, even when I went from like traditional Hollywood uh, you know, at a big studio Miramax to a, a little startup that, you know, in the digital world, which was at that time was like the Wild West. It, mm. it still is to some degree. I remember people looking at me like, oh my God, what is she? And this is the second time I also moved to London in 1999. And I remember like one of these guys saying to me like, oh, you're throwing your career away. Like you just built, you know, all these, you just spent years in LA and now you're like going off to London. And that same guy, bless his heart, called me a couple years later and was like, you know, you really did do the right thing. But the point is I had to take crazy risks. Yeah. And it's really uncomfortable. I've moved to new cities four times in my adult life. Yeah, it takes a couple years to get settled somewhere, and you know, it's uh, it's probably been at a detriment to my personal life to a degree. But you know what? I knew what I was really passionate about. I knew what I wanted, and I think it's harder for women to take those risks than for men. It, you know, I think it's you know, men somehow are conditioned to think that they can just try well, anything. It's a lot and about how we were socialized, though. If you think about like you, they have all these conversations around how women are outperforming men in school, like all the way through undergrad, women outperform men. We have better grades across almost every single thing, and maybe we, we drop out of STEM, but we're still doing better than them in STEM when we stick in. And if you think about it, I'm, I'm now in, in the education world, so I'm now I'm, I'm working with Startup Institute in New York, um, and the big conversation around education is you can't even reform the current education model, you need to like throw it out and redesign it, because current education does not reward risk taking. Mm. It doesn't reward <laughs> trying and failing, you just get an F. 
it rewards following the rules. And girls are really good at following the rules, and that's why we, we get great grades. And we were rock stars through school, and then we graduate and we say, well, now what am I supposed to do? Like, you told me what was on the syllabus, I got an A+, plus, but that's not how you get ahead That's not how life works. And yeah, that's right. why no one wants to submit a pitch right. that's half-baked, even if what's half-baked will win. Because you want to do your best. You want to, you know, do what you've been told to do, which is like the very best, and that's what gets you ahead. What and concerns that's where the me. Result, I mean, when you've gotten the feedback about Absolutely. that, when you've done it, and when you haven't yeah. done it right. in different ways in your male counterparts. Um, yeah, go ahead. I was, what concerns me, and I've seen it happen with a few of my friends and, and women that are just a little bit older than me, and you kind of get sick of the risk taking at some point. Mm. And, right. Because yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> and it kind of gets a little bit old because, again, you're the only lady in the room, or again, you're kind of running into these barriers. And so I hope that I think what we're trying to all accomplish, and hopefully the people in this room, and is creating a world where it's not that difficult just to do more it. of us doing it. Too, right. right. And it's, yeah. not, it's not risky, it's just is how hopefully future right. people. <laughs> future but you kids. Have something future here, people. actually, right? Because there, there's creating a world <laughs> where it's going to be better. Hmm. But and then there's also like how to negotiate in the world as it is. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. there are there are, two, there are two things there, and you, you have to do the second before you can get to the first. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the that point. one of the things that makes this conversation so contentious is because you know mm -hmm. that everybody argues about how you're supposed to get to where you're supposed to be. And mm. what the you know whether or not you should do the real politic thing like this. I've seen articles on like ladies wear that short skirt, wear that low cut shirt. You might as well get ahead with what you got. Versus, I mean, and I've seen these are I've seen that on like Forbes Woman, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are uh. these are this is legitimately and and it's legitimately a subject for debate. Like how does one again the the fifty percent of your character that you're wearing on your body? How do you what how what what version of yourself ought you be? Mm -hmm. And and so I think that uh, this is why this is thorny and it's prickly and it's and and mm -hmm. th this is also why this may not be the panel you thought you were going to get <laughs> because we could this panel could have gone any number of ways. Um, so on that note, uh, we are supposed to have questions. I don't know. The microphones are like behind most of you. Yeah, I imagine you should yeah, just yeah, all go there. line up on them if you if you have questions. Oh, there's a microphone right there. This is everybody who wants to go. Spotlight. Yes, just get up and this go. Go, Christine. And, 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 Take that long walk to the microphone. I have short legs, so it takes a second. <laughs> All right, should I just move it up? Yeah, please do. Initiative. I like okay, it. I love it. Do what you want. <laughs> yes. like she's asking as Good. she's doing it. Do what you want. <laughs> yeah. All right. Go, Christine. It's better to it's better to ask forgiveness than okay. permission. Okay. Always. All right. Good afternoon. I'm standing up as um, representing one of four, five African American women and one dude. Thanks for coming to rep and support. So my name is Christine Johnson. I'm the founder of Diversity Tech. We focus on making sure there are more women and ethnic minorities participating in the tech startup space. I'm out of the DC area. So I really wanted to stand up here and say, I'm glad that you referenced the lack of minority women representation on the panel because that was the first thing that I noticed. Mm -hmm. And in discussing diversity as far as women, I think it's imperative that minority women participate. There, there are a number of women that are doing great things to change the ratio in this space from um, Anna, I can't remember her last name, from Latism, um, Ilya Ramos, uh, you talk about Catherine Finney, um, it's a newbie on the scene um, named Kat Calvin and um, Kimberly Bryant from Black Girls Code and beyond that. So I just wanted to say I, I always really welcome these, these dialogues, but I sit there and I'm like, there's really another voice and perspective that's missing in this discussion. And I think that being a, a woman that is working hard in the space and facing a lot of challenges, definitely as a female and as an African American um, in, the, in the male dominated tech space. I, I tell you, I, I go and I, I've learned so much in the past two years, but what's really critical is that when we talk about our experiences as women as a whole in this country, the richness of it is missing. There are, there's an, an Asian woman perspective, um, there's just you know the Indian model, so I, I think it's critical that that is at the forefront when we 
develop these amazing panels, I'm the one that gets the call at the last minute as well. So, I could, so well, that's let me ask you, how can, we, how can we change that? I mean, I'm throwing this out to you. Like, how, how can I change that? As someone who clearly is trying, like, we've never met. I don't know you. I will Hello. now. And, <laughs> and I, will be, I will be glad too. But so that, how do we get from the people, the person who, who is organizing it mm -hmm. knows about mm -hmm. to taking it a step further? Like, what's your advice for people like me and anybody else who's organizing this stuff? Yeah, and I, I always say that um, it's very intentional. You know, it's going to Kathleen, and she knows most, she knows all the women I just named, um, and saying, hey, do you have a binder full of women? <laughs> 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 the infamous binder, but it's real. So just being okay with asking those questions and um, accessing the resources. Even if you Google, like, black women in tech, those ladies will pop up. Um, minorities in tech, diversity in tech, it'll pop up. I think that there's no shame in it. We just need to be, you know, diversifying it happens with intention. And it's a, it's a, it's a step, it's, it's more work, but it's worthy, you know, to have a, a, a rich panel. So I would say just reaching out to the resources that you have to say, hey, do you know anyone that would be good for this panel? Um, and again, I'd like to add that I feel successful in my work because I get those calls, you know? And how can I be mad about that? You know, people are really being intentional about uh, changing the space. So utilizing your resources, I think, would be a great way to do that as well. So, so basically, we're still, we're still, we're back to Yoda. Do or do not, there is no try. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to talk after for sure. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for, for being the first person to stand up and for moving the mic closer. Um, who's next? Hello. Hi. Um, Thank you for this, this panel. Um, I guess um, my question is, you know, I have a sister who now has a PhD in science education. Um, one of the things she likes to talk about is the fact that she had three brothers and a father who were always really supportive of her to have the confidence to go pursue the things that she wants to do. And now I have my own daughter and I want to encourage her as well. Do any of you have advice for somebody who is playing life at the lowest difficulty level? Um, the things that we can do to encourage more of this? Buy our Tinker Toys. She has so many Legos you don't even know. Brilliant. No, I mean, but seriously, like, I was raised by a mom, a grandmother, and a sister. So, like, I didn't have men in my life. It's a very opposite, you know, uh, uh, approach. But um, there was never an assumption of, like, here are the girl things, go do them. Uh, it was very much like, you're we smart. Let's, let's follow through on this. Like, you, you have a natural inclination toward math, and that's weird and dorky, but, like, yay, let's take you to math camp. Um, and so but it's, maybe it's only weird, weird and dorky because you're a girl. But that was going to be. Yeah. I mean, true, absolutely. That was that's certainly no, a thing. But, um, but it's it's you know like uh, give her enough um, access to different things that she can find a natural interest in something, and then double down on it, <laughs> even if it's not something you would have pushed her toward I'm now. On the I other would also say the... celebrate her failures. Like, yeah. encourage her to do stuff that she's not comfortable with and fail. Like, I've got a 24-year-old, she hates to fail. And I'm, you know, too. and it's, I mean, I hate to fail. It's like, sucks, mm -hmm. right? It does suck. But celebrate that, push her, challenge What'd you learn today? What, what'd you screw up today? Hmm. Like, oh my God, what'd you learn? Like, encourage that curiosity and that fearlessness. And whatever it is, like, you know what? Maybe she's gonna be, like, you know, something really girly or, you know, traditionally girly. That's okay as long as she's just being hmm. somebody awesome and fearless in the world. I think passion is part of it too. And I think obviously you want her to have a well-rounded life and, and experience different things, but you have so many parents, I think, don't like accept kids' passion. I mean, I know yep. even with certain family members of mine were incredibly uh, he's supportive when I told him I wanted to like go work in Hollywood after getting a very good education. Others were like appalled. You know, oh my God, what a hideous business. Oh my God, people are so mean. Oh my God, nobody ever succeeds. You know, it's, it's really letting, and, I, and that's exactly what I said. I said, if I'm gonna fall flat on my face, I would rather do this in my early 20s than, you know, when I was 40. Um, but I, I just think they ha she will have to pursue her real passion. Uh, and so many people don't do that. The one thing I would add, too, is, I mean, we're all giving you, like, I don't know how old your daughter is or whatever, but we're all telling you how to raise her. Um, I don't have children of my own, but nope. I do wish I had been socialized a lot better around money. Mm. Understanding oh, how to great. use it, oh. how to ask for yeah. it, how, you know, what, what my value was, feeling comfortable about it. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a huge issue for women 
and, uh, and, and I, so I talk about that as often as I can. Mm. And I would Great just point. do two things, and this, if I ever have children, I'd be the worst parent ever, force her to code, and if she doesn't want her, then whatever, but force her to code. The other thing, um, my mom always, it was just like, oh, well, there's, I was really lucky, there's just, I was always told there's nothing I can't do. Mm, and like, I, don't, I feel like other people I've met have never, were never told that really basic line of mm -hmm. there's just nothing you, can, you can't do. Mm -hmm. And then all these other things kind of fall into place, whatever that is. Awesome, thanks so much. She's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. No pressure. Hi, thanks so much for this panel. I am wondering if um, you guys, Cal, sorry, could share your thoughts on sort of unlearning the lessons of behaving well in the professional environment. I feel like I spent my entire life being tamped down by people around me, and I feel like I'm at my best in any group that I'm working with in any collaboration when I am mm. being like my best inappropriate self, but it's difficult for me. It's kind of a skill I'm still working on. I, I can speak to that because I had a very good first boss slash mentor who was almost like feared in business, and he's actually now one of the heads of Warner Brothers, but um, he was very, he was almost feared because he, and he had, like, he was kind of considered not very user friendly. But what I really learned from him was, I would rather be respected and effective than popular. And, uh, you know, I'm always the first one to have the uncomfortable conversation. I'm always the first one to speak my mind and give my opinion, you know, not in a like gold star way, but in a like, you know, the elephant in the room is sitting there and nobody wants to deal with it. And I just think, you, you know, and I really do carry that with me is I'd rather be respected than, than popular. I think the other thing for me, my, my big like setback at the end of kind of college and coming into my 20s was this A, fear of failure, and B, fear of not having a plan. I love oh, plans. Yeah. Plans yeah. like, if you give me a plan, I can optimize around the plan. If you don't give me a plan, like, ah! And it, it was really debilitating. It was paralyzing. I was sobbing in my advisor's floor of like, what do I do when I graduate? There's no plan. Uh, and it kept me from wanting to do freelance jobs. It kept me from like mm -hmm. keeping my mind open. I would rather have like a three year set job than a, you know, no plan, which is opposite now. And the way I got over that was traveling internationally by myself with uh, a flight in and a flight out and some money and like having to figure it out as I went. And, and part of that came about because I had some time and some money and no one wanted to travel with me and it was a very stark realization, like either I do this by myself or I don't get this opportunity in my life. Mm. So I'm gonna do it by myself. And through that, got a series of failures in foreign countries that I don't speak languages um, and, and quickly got to learn this, A, a comfort with uncertainty and B, um, the belief that I am smart enough and strong enough to figure it out. And I don't know what it is yet, but it's gonna be okay. And having to sit in that uncertainty over and over and over again, I've now traveled to like almost 20 countries by myself, um, and it, it gets easy, but it doesn't always get comfortable with mm -hmm. that uncertainty, but, but learning what that feels like, recognizing that, and saying I felt this before and it all worked out okay, it's the only reason I was able to start a company. The, you, you're stressing me out a little bit, just if you're gonna travel by yourself, make sure you have enough money and call frequently and check in and make sure people know where you are. It can be dangerous out there. I kept a blog, my mom knew which A message from mo your moderator. Um, I, for me, I, I, we all have our different experiences, right? But what I've found, because I haven't had the most amazing bosses, is now I have to set really firm boundaries around mm. what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, um, you know, things I probably shouldn't have to be doing, but things that I do have to do, because I'm pretty friendly and laid back and just, you know, open. Uh, and so I, that's how I've, uh, how I've unlearned it and help other people unlearn it is like, just now, you now, let's, let's not talk about your weekend anymore. I'm so <laughs> sick of hearing about it. <laughs> no, just, just really quickly, I mean, I just, you know, just the, the soul searching part of, you know, who, who am I, who mm. are you, who's your authentic self, what do you want to be, and sort of straight, stay true to that, where you're, you know, both putting yourself out there, and it, it's uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable to, you know, you know, let go of old habits or things that feel comfortable and safe. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, but yet true to yourself, you're probably doing the right thing, and just do that every day. And I have concrete tips. Um, raise the hand high if you're gonna raise it. Uh, sit at the power seat on the table. Definitely don't sit in one of those seats against the wall. Uh, and experiment off. with uh, doubling your price and then saying it to someone with a straight face. That helps mm. a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
I just want to say thanks a lot for the panel. I have uh, two, two thoughts, one question. So first of all, I want to back Christina 100%. There does need to be more diversity on these kind of panels of women of color. Mm -hmm. You know, she and I are different. We face very different issues. And I think a lot of people look at diversity as a zero-sum game. If there's one of us up there, there's not one of you down here. But you know, at the end of the day, we're all women. And it's like Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. And then kind of on that note, you know, I've seen a lot of this unfortunately happening where women take each other down in the workplace. How can we talk about how we can create a culture of mentorship among women, especially older women and younger women in the workplace? So I'm going to answer that by wondering aloud whether, like, why there isn't uh, fretting about how men don't help men in the yeah. workplace. Because mm -hmm. I, like, I personally know a lot of dudes who have like knifed other dudes in the back mm -hmm. without thinking twice about it. Uh, I think it's again has to do with the a scarcity issue, uh, the zero sum game issue, the fact that if this wasn't a panel of of all women, there would be only one spot for a woman. Typically, even, even according to the rules, as Hugh opened up with by saying he wants at least one woman on the panel. So, so when, when it, things are so much more competitive and difficult, you will see that. So I actually, I think that m more than anything else, we've actually seen a ton of examples of women helping women. At least that's, now that I'm in that field, Officially, that's what I see most of the time. Um, but it's been made official with Cheryl Sandberg's book and, and the, the infrastructure she set up with the Lean In Circles, which is specifically about getting together with women to talk about this stuff and support each other. And what you, what you see when that happens is that you are not professionally lonely, like maybe you felt you were. This is a phrase my co-founder, Clintus, and I use a lot with the list. Uh, you know, you, you professional loneliness and being alienated from where you want to go is, is a really big inhibitor. And when suddenly you're part of a community, you have the strength to do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely see your point uh, for, the first, for the first one and, and rocking the Yoda. It's a running theme. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, do, I sort of push back a little bit on the, the woman don't help woman thing. Thank you for the panel. I'm Joyce Sullivan. I uh, spoke last year. And actually, I'm happy to see an all women panel. Uh, my panel last year, just to give perspective, was a uh, very serious topic, financial services, social media, and for uh, executives who do it at their banks around the world, oh, and they happen to be all women. So it was a topic we covered, and we had just women. So we were all set to go, and uh, the folks at South By, if Hugh's not here, he says, you don't have any diversity on your panel. You have to drop one of your women and add a guy. So we worked it out, but we had all women, so uh, it's great to see. But I was glad to hear um, just even the conversation to know that diversity is not just women. I think having people from other uh, backgrounds really adds to that. Uh, so I guess what I want to say is, you know, I had a full career in financial services, quit to start my own thing. And uh, for anybody else thinking about it's too late to start, you can, and I'm still on my journey, and I know some of you, but I'd love to meet all of you, and uh, just want to say thanks for the inspiration, and keep it going. Thanks. That's very interesting okay. about um, uh, yeah. dropping a woman <laughs> for a man, because I, I certainly remember all male panels last year. And <laughs> oh, and the and keynote this year. yesterday. And, yeah. Well, and well, this year. On serendipity. Yeah. Well, that's, thanks for that too, but Joyce. Um, all right, we got 47 seconds. Let's, um, okay. let's try and do this Tweeted. really bull bullet time. Hi everyone, sorry I've been networking like a mad woman, but um, <laughs> no. my name is Obi, I'm the founder of a startup called Pop and Gym, uh, and I'm based out of New York, and my background is 100% all female education, I went to all female school from the age of four up through graduating through high school, and then I went to Wellesley for undergrad, and I just had a question wondering how many of you have had all female education um, in your backgrounds, because for me, being around more of a co-ed environment, I have less of a filter because I have never really felt the need to hold back. And a lot of women around me tend to hold back. So just seeing some of you who are actually successful, it's nice to, I, I would like to Holyoke. see, you know, what your background has been in terms yeah. of education. I did, I went to Mount Holyoke, so I did go to a female, yeah, a women's that. college. Um, and definitely it was, you know, look, I mean, Lester, Wendy Wasserstein, and you know, plenty of cabinet members. I mean, it's, uh, I, I mean, it definitely helped shape feeling like I could do anything, mm. for sure. That's cool. I, I didn't go to an all-girls school, but I went to an arts boarding school, which was extremely diverse, both across, like, international, it had LGBT presence, it had, I mean, it was, like, the polar opposite of Michigan, where I grew up. 
um, where everyone's all the same. Uh, and I think that was a big part of it too. Perhaps just extreme diversity functions in the same way that, that a little bit of like cohesiveness functions in, which says, okay, if we're already are gonna have like different opinions, then like fine, have different opinions. Like you're not gonna be castigated for having some uh, opposing viewpoint in the room. Um, we are now 54 seconds over time, so I think it's appropriate that Obi was our last question because it brings it back to Star Wars, sort of, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm sure you never ever get that. Rock. I'm really sorry, but I really couldn't resist. Um, all right, I actually forgot to say what the hashtag was at the beginning of this. Uh, it's uh, so SXS Woman. Uh, so please tweet, comments, questions, contact information at all of us. Um, I'm Rachel Sklar, I'm at Rachel Sklar, I think it's written down there. Uh, so let's keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Take what you will from this panel. If there was stuff you didn't like, let me know because everything's a work in progress and we're all pushing this forward together. Mm -hmm. And I really do mean that. So um, I would just like to thank my amazing panelists for coming together on this very last hour of the last <laughs> day of South by Southwest Interactive. And thank all of you for not going to the adult film panel <laughs> next door. Um, stay in touch and you know, remember diversity. All right, thank you. Thank you.